My life has been guided by disasters. It starts here. I grew up in this house in northern Thailand along the river. And during times of torrential rain, the river would overflow, flooding the surrounding area. You can see from the smiles on the face of my mother and little sister that these weren't catastrophic events, but they certainly had an impact in underpinning my interest in nature's extremes. I went to do a degree in engineering at MIT, and in order to escape the cold over winter break, went on vacation to the southeastern coast of India and landed on December 26, 2004. I'm not sure if you remember what happened on that day, but that was the day of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. It impacted 14 countries around the region and was the deadliest disaster, one of the deadliest, in recorded history. And I remember seeing the devastation and the flooding from the plane and not understanding what had happened. We hadn't heard about a storm. And luckily, um, the airport was a bit inland, so we were safe. But seeing the impact of that event on communities had a tremendous impact on me. So when I went back to MIT, I decided to study earthquake engineering. Because I wanted to understand if we could build more resilient buildings that could withstand some of these disaster extremes. Now, there wasn't an earthquake engineering program at MIT, but there were researchers working on old buildings. And old buildings are really interesting. They've survived a lot. They've survived extremes. So I did research to try to understand how they did so, because in their longevity, perhaps could lie the blueprint for resilience. When I was finished with that, I thought, well, perhaps another way to build resilience is through better materials. If we have stronger materials than our buildings, we'll be able to withstand these disasters. And so I studied uh, hybrid fiber reinforced concretes. These are concretes with fibers that act like stitching to prevent cracks and create concretes that can even bend. When I finished my master's, there was a huge earthquake that occurred in Haiti and devastated the capital city of Port-au-Prince. And I was asked by the World Bank if I could help with assessing the damage and needs. And I was supposed to only be there for a few weeks, but the needs were so huge that I ended up staying there for two years working on various disaster uh, recovery and reconstruction programs. And in fact, my supervisor and mentor from the time, Francis Gesquier, is in the audience today, which I'm very grateful for. What came out of that experience is a real belief that understanding risk at the building scale or at the material scale is only part of the equation. In order to really have impact, we need to be able to analyze and measure how risk is created at the scale of entire cities. And so I did a PhD specifically to develop models of urban risk. While I was there, I also initiated the Stanford Urban Resilience Initiative as a multidisciplinary platform to investigate the complexities at the intersection of risk in cities. My case study for my PhD was in fact Kathmandu City in Nepal. And as I was writing my dissertation in 2015, as many of you know, that part of the world was impacted by a major event. So I found myself once again on the ground to see how my work could support in the response and recovery efforts. Now here in Singapore, I lead the Disaster Analytics for Society Lab at NTU, and we look not only at the way that extreme events impacts buildings and cities, but also the people who live in them. And we look as well at how these extreme events have different impacts on different people and different communities because of underlying social vulnerability. We don't only look at earthquakes, we look at the other hazards that are prevalent in this region, volcanoes, typhoons, sea level rise, and other coastal hazards, extreme heat, and more. I've been using this term risk, and I wanted to unpack really what this means. Risk is created through the combination of three things, hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. Where hazards, those are the extreme events. Those are the earthquakes, the floods, the typhoons, 
Exposure are the people, the buildings, the roads that might get impacted by those hazards. A very large earthquake in the middle of the desert might not create risk because there's no one there, while a small earthquake under a big city can create huge risk because of the concentration and exposure. And finally, in order to create risk, you need vulnerability. And vulnerability describes the propensity to suffer harm or damage caused by a hazard event. So two buildings might have different vulnerability to flooding because one is elevated, which enables water to flow underneath it, while the other one is at ground level. And you can think about it the same way with social vulnerability. Different communities might be differently vulnerable, um, perhaps because of poverty or other issues of inequity. So core to my interest is to try to understand how risk is changing. And in large part, that's driven by a concern that it's increasing. You've heard probably of links between climate change and extreme events. Now, why is that? What's going on? It fundamentally comes down to this curve. This is a probability distribution. It could represent the likelihood of different amounts of rainfall or temperature or wind. In most days, rain is fine. In fact, it's very important. We need it. What we're concerned about is extreme rain. If it rains too intensely or for too long, that can cause a flood. Likewise for heat. Here in Singapore, we've adapted to heat. And we can do so by changing our clothes or going in an air conditioning. What we're concerned about, though, is extreme heat. And in some other places, it might be extreme cold. Now, luckily, these events are pretty rare. But what we're concerned about is even a small shift in the average of this distribution leads to a huge increase in the number of extreme events. So a one degree or two degree increase in mean temperature might not seem very significant, but in fact it is because of what it means for the number of extreme events that we can expect. Likewise, even a small increase in the variability of this distribution leads to more extreme events. And what we're seeing is that with climate change, for many of our processes, both are going on at the same time. So we have an increase in the average and an increase in variability. And you can see what that does to the number of extreme events. And that's in large part why we've been hearing so much about these events in the news. Events that used to be rare are now more common. Not only that, we can now expect to experience unprecedented extremes, events that are of a magnitude larger than anything we've seen before. And we're certainly not prepared for those, in part because we haven't experienced them. So that's going on on the hazard side. How about the exposure? Well, our global population is increasing, and most of that is being absorbed in cities. And most of that is even coastal cities, which are more exposed to multiple hazards, such as sea level rise, coastal storms, tsunamis, uh, typhoons, and more. Just to give you a sense of the scale at which urbanization is ongoing, there are more people living in cities today than were total people on the planet in 1980. And 1980 is really not very long ago. If you need a reference, that's when uh, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back was released, really not too long ago. And in fact, these processes of rapid urbanization are still ongoing. And that's not a problem per se, but we do need to understand what that means in terms of our exposure to hazards. Now, this is happening at the macro scale, but then when you look at the local scale within cities themselves, what you see is that as cities get constrained in space, that creates more and more pressure for people to occupy more and more hazardous land. So people will start building on steep slopes, and they will start building on floodplains, putting themselves in harm's way. And we see this in cities all over the world. Now, finally, vulnerability. That's a bit more complicated, but we think that we're getting better in the way that we build our infrastructure. In fact, we have very little evidence of this outside of very specific geographies. Our infrastructure is aging, and we have examples of spontaneous collapse of bridges because of this aging. And as our urban systems become increasingly interconnected, both within cities and between cities, that's creating new forms of vulnerability that we have yet to fully consider.
So a flood in Bangkok can have repercussions on the other side of the world. And this is not a hypothetical example. We saw this following the 2011 floods in Bangkok. It had huge impacts on the supply chain industry, specifically for electronics. If you tried to buy a computer that year, you would have known it was very expensive to do so. So local events can have global impacts. So I've been talking about how we have increasing hazards, we have increasing exposure, increasing vulnerability in many ways. And that paints a pretty grim picture of our risk future. But in fact, I think there's many reasons to be hopeful. And I wanted to share with you why I see the glass being half full. The first is that we have so many of the solutions already. Cities are putting in place nature-based solutions to protect themselves against some of these environmental extremes. For instance, parks can serve as water retention systems during days of flood. And every other day that it doesn't flood, these are great environments that we can all enjoy. We have better monitoring systems and alert systems that will send a signal directly to our phones to alert us of extreme events. We've developed more advanced analytics using combinations of remote sensing, AI, and other tools to better quantify risk. This is useful not only for cities and decision makers, but also for businesses. And our lab is very active in this space. There are new governance structures to better manage risk and an increasing recognition that issues of resilience and issues of equity are fundamentally interlinked. And we see communities proactively trying to tackle both hand in hand. There are innovations in risk financing, bringing more funding for investing in disaster resilience and also providing financial protections to the most vulnerable communities. In remote sensing technologies, satellite technologies to better monitor our environmental extremes. The fundamental problem though is that when we implement these solutions, and we do, and when they work, almost by definition, no one hears about it. You don't hear about the flood that occurs and doesn't damage any buildings and no lives are lost. It's very hard to notice the absence of something. So while our climate problems are very visible, our solutions are not. Case in point, how many of you have heard about Hurricane Katrina? Most of you. How many of you have heard about Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines? Most people as well. How many of you have heard about Cyclone Fanny? Very few people. Cyclone Fanny was the largest cyclone to make landfall in India in 20 years. It was a huge event. The reason no one knows about it is because the government had built thousands of emergency shelters, evacuated millions of people, and almost no one lost their lives during this event. It was a huge success, and that should be known. So we developed counterfactual probabilistic analysis, which is a mouthful. But fundamentally, it comes down to asking, what if things had been worse? What if people had not been evacuated prior to the cyclone? What would the consequences have been? And can we use that as evidence for the importance and value of these types of investments and interventions? So we did the reanalysis. And we see that that evacuation likely saved thousands, possibly 10,000 lives. And that's really important. And that should be celebrated. We need to be better at learning from our successes. Yes, it's important to learn from failures and catastrophe, but no one has ever learned how to ride a bicycle by watching YouTube videos of people falling off bikes. We need to learn from successes so that we can better share them with others, so that they can be replicated, scaled, adapted in the many communities around the world that need them. So in this effort, we launched two years ago the Averted Disaster Award with the help of the World Bank and the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, specifically in order to identify and celebrate the really important work, often very humble work, that people are doing around the world to protect themselves against disasters. Work which 
because it's successful, is invisible. And so we want to bring vis visibility to these types of interventions. There's another reason why I'm hopeful. We focus so much on the hazards, and it is true that faced with the power of nature, it's hard not to feel small and powerless. It's even in the words that we use, the word disaster quite literally means a calamity faded from the stars. It connotes the idea that there's nothing we can do about it. It's outside of our control. But that's not true. Yes, the city of Manila cannot stop the occurrence of a typhoon, nor can San Francisco stop the occurrence of earthquakes. But they can control their risk. We control our exposure and vulnerability. We decide where we build and how we build. And fundamentally, that's what sets our risk and resilience. So if you come back to this graphic on urbanization, yes, it's a source of concern. It's also a source of opportunity. In order to meet the needs of the growing urban population, we will have to build so much infrastructure. If we do this with an understanding of our climate risk and disaster risk more broadly, we can really set ourselves on a more resilient path. In our lab, we've developed tools to account for the dynamics of hazards, exposure, and vulnerability so that we can see our trajectory of risk. This is important because it empowers us to change direction. I'm part of the Tomorrow Cities program, which is helping cities use these types of tools to better measure and manage their risk. And through a recent startup, we're helping businesses do the same. We have the tools today to understand where we're heading when it comes to our risk and how decisions we make today can change that for the better. I find this incredibly empowering, and I hope you do too. Thank you.